Welcome back, everybody. It is session five of our Redemption Workshop semester. I love this topic of redemption. Who is God? Who is God? Did you make him in your image or is it something that God has revealed to us in terms of his nature, his being? Who are you? And then who are the people around you? We're also asking how do we interpret all the events of life when we have grief and sorrow? What is it that is the authority that we put over it to determine what's actually true and what is false? Well, today we're going to continue talking about redemption and what Jesus did for you and I that takes the will of God out of this ancillary side issue uh, kind of mindset and puts it central down into his very crucifixion and resurrection from the dead. Once you see that what God's will is, is not about some side issue that's outside uh, of, of God's very redemptive plan, but it's inside his redemption, it creates a passion for you. It moves it from a promise down into an actual fact. So today we're going to talk about this fact. Last time we were together in session four, we looked at how there is a parallel. There is a continuity between sin, open sin, sin, sin that's unatoned, and sickness, disease, and shortness of life or death. We also flip that and see that where there's forgiveness of sin, where there is atonement or the Old Testament word atonements for the New Testament word redemption, where there is redemption, there is health, healing, there's forgiveness of sin, of course, and then there is life and longevity. So what we're doing is we're drawing these lines, this system. We're really not talking about healing and we're not just talking about like prosperity. We're using the biblical model of a system to show us how to live in peace and joy, to access the wisdom of God in any given situation, the favor of God that is upon our lives. As we walk into scenarios, we know we are crowned with favor. We're crowned with favor, not because God is just giving a promise and somehow he's going to intervene in that moment just kind of in a mood or in a sovereign act, but actually he's doing it because his sovereign act sent Jesus to Calvary's cross and because Jesus was crucified, our sin was done away, now then we are crowned with favor. So let's pick it up here and let's dive into the very nature of God. This is why it's so important. This, this is why it's so important that you and I uh, are able to take the character of God and pour it over and to look at all of the conflict scriptures of the Bible. Anything that we don't understand, we've got to start with who is God? Who is his nature? How does he express himself? How does he reveal himself? When we talk about who is God, who is God, we're talking about a God that's really beyond human capacity to comprehend. It really takes the agency of the Holy Spirit to unveil or reveal who he is as a person. And as we begin to understand who he is as a person, we're going to read certain texts that seem to be contradictory to that. And once we read those texts that are contradictory, we cannot let them coexist. We've got to take our greatest revelation of the nature and person of God and then put it back towards those conflict situations and say, we must have a misunderstanding. There must be a solution to this that we haven't known prior. And then as we begin to explore it, we'll find out there is a solution. There is an understanding. And all of a sudden you have this continuity, you have this clarity between those conflict scriptures and what is the goodness of God. So as we talk about God's very nature, one of the things that I want you to understand is that God doesn't change. So if you ever see something in his nature, you know that that is going to be a constant. That God isn't shifting, he's not adjusting, he's not becoming something new. That God is the same, he's the same. He says, I am the Lord God and I change not. We also are going to get a tremendous insight to the very person of the Father through Jesus. In Hebrews, in the early chapters, it says that Jesus himself is the impressed image of God the Father. The impressed is, in some translations say it this way, the exact image of God the Father. So if you ever want to know what God the Father's nature is, all you have to do is look at Jesus. 
because Jesus is a perfect revelation of God the Father. So if you, for instance, think about God being good, God is good, all you have to do is say, what does good look like? And then follow Jesus around and watch his attitudes, watch how he interacts with people, watch what he does to people and for people and with people. That is a perfect revelation of the goodness of God. We'll cycle back around to that. But to begin with, I want to say that God, God is self-existent, self-existent. In fact, there's a term in the scripture that labels God, it's a name, he is Jehovah. Jehovah. You've probably heard the word Jehovah. And the word Jehovah simply means I am that I am. It means I am self-existed. I'm non-contingent. What I mean by non-contingent is I don't have to rely on anybody or anything. I derive my existence from my own being. I don't derive my existence from an outside creator or influence. So God is Jehovah. He is Jehovah, meaning he's self-existent. In that same context, he's also sovereign. And what we mean by the fact that God is sovereign is he can do whatever he wants to do. That God is held accountable to no one. He doesn't have to give any report of his comings or his goings to anybody. God can do whatever God wants to do. Now, a lot of people hijack that concept and then they quickly simplify it to mean that God can be in a mood or God can do anything at this given moment that he wants to do. But there are some things that God can't do now because an act of his sovereignty that has already happened. What do I mean by that? Well, God's already said he can't lie. He can't lie. So even in his sovereignty, he can't lie. He's just not going to. It's not a part of his nature. He cannot lie. Well, in that same progress or progression, God can't lie. So if God gives you his word on something, if God tells you what his sovereign will is about a thing, God will not change that word. In fact, there's a scripture. This is interesting. There's a scripture in uh, the Old Testament that says that God exalts his word even above his name. His name represents his person, his nature, his character. And God says, I'm going to exalt my word above my name. What he's saying is, is if you really want to know who I am, look at my word. You want to know what my will is, look at my word. All of that's to extrapolate down to this one thought. And get this. The word of God is the published sovereignty of God. So God's nature of sovereignty, he can do whatever he wants But he has revealed to us what he wants as a sovereign communication called his word. That means that today God's not going to adjust. He's not going to shift. He's not going to change. He is always going to stay consistent with his word. Now, this is important because this is his nature. And God will not, will not, will not violate his own nature. God will always remain holy. And the word holy means absolute. This is another component of the nature of God. He is holy. He's absolute in all his ways. There's an intensity to his nature. There is a concentration of his nature. God is holy. He's absolute. He's not a mixture of anything. And so if God were to ever change, if he were to ever lie, if there were any shifts or adjustments in what we know is the nature of God, it would violate all the rest of the nature of God and he would would cease being God. He would cease being holy and he would cease being self-existent. He would cease being faithful. So let's go through some various thoughts as to the nature and person of God. We know that God is is everywhere. He's present everywhere. We call that omnipresent. He's everywhere. So God can reveal himself in a given space and time, space and time. God can give himself a revelation to us in that space and time. But God, he is in essence everywhere. Also, he's all knowing. That means from this fancy word, he's omniscient. He knows everything. There isn't anything hidden from God. You know, when we walk into a three-dimensional experience, we see somebody and we're in a room and there's crowds and there's music and there's smells, there's things being cooked, baked or served or whatever. All that's taken place and we have a limited perspective of what's happening. 
We only can see what is in front of us and within our peripheral vision. We can only experience what we are able to contact with our five physical senses. But with God, not only does he see what is right in front of us, he sees every angle, every perspective. He sees even outside these three dimensions, he sees things that are happening in spiritual dimensions. He sees demonic activity, angelic activity. He understands what is going on even deep within the heart of every human being in the environment. He, he knows the motives, he knows the attitudes, he knows the backstory, he knows what's triggering those people, he knows what has them bound up, he knows what their proclivities are, he knows their vulnerabilities, he knows every single thing about every human, there isn't anything hidden. In fact, he also knows that about the other dimensions. He realizes what Satan and demons, what their motives are, what their plan is. There isn't any secrets hidden from the Father. He knows it all. He knows everything there is to know. And it's not something for which God has to learn. God does not have an educational process. God doesn't have to learn about what Satan is doing. He already, in his self-existence, in his sovereignty, in his nature, he already he knows everything Satan's doing. He knows what the angels are doing. He knows their assignments, uh, both good and evil. He knows everything Satan and the divine angels of God, the angels of heaven. He knows what all of them are about and why they're about what they're about. God also knows things that are going to happen before they happen. It's just wild. There isn't anything hidden from God in past or present, but there's nothing hidden from God in the future. God can see it all before it ever happens. And it's interesting because God can know something that's going to happen in the future without influencing its outcome, much like you and I can know something about the past history. We can know something about it without influencing or changing history. God can look into the future and know any and everything that is out there. God knows tomorrow before it gets here. This is a part of the nature of God. This isn't God straining. It's not God like cramming for a test. It's not like God's putting a lot of a mental uh, fire into this. This is just the nature of God. This is who he is. He's also uh, all powerful. That means that he has all the power. Omnipotent, omnipotent. He, he has it all. There isn't any power that doesn't or have its origin in God. Now, God has delegated power out. Out, that power got hijacked. And so Satan himself today is operating in power that originated with God, but it is not God's will because in fact, it all came through Adam and Eve sinning. And then when they sinned, they turned over certain power that God had delegated to Adam and Eve. They turned it over to Satan and Satan became the quote unquote God of this world. But all power originally found its roots in the nature and character of God. He is all powerful. There isn't anything more powerful than God. Nothing. There isn't anything that can even compete with God. Sometimes people seem to think that there is this big war of good and evil, kind of like God has just, you know, maybe uh, a fraction of a percentage more power than the enemy. And so there's a big war. Th there is no war. It doesn't even compare. God is all powerful and any power that the enemy Satan has is actually a derivative of his God's delegation that Satan now is operating in and it's about legalities. It isn't about him actually owning the power. So we understand that God is all powerful. That is miracle power. It is supernatural power. It is power that invades the physical world, that disrupts the natural order of things and creates uh, an outcome of goodness and an outcome of mercy. We know that God is unchanging. He's uh, immutable. He's unlimited. He's infinite. He's out time, outside of time and space. That means he is eternal. He's independent of the universe. He's transcendent. And again, that's because he's non-contingent. He doesn't have any uh, influence or he doesn't have any uh, surrender or submission to any other uh, being or influence in the universe. Uh, he is affectionately interested in creation. He is affectionately interested in creation. We call that imminent. He is the source and existence of all future things. He's providential. 
He can be providential without controlling everything that happens. He can actually, through his divine nature, his divine wisdom, his divine counsel, he can influence the outcome of things without controlling the outcome and again retain his justice. Well, those are just some basic ideas, but I want us to now drill just into a couple of of pieces of his nature that I find uh, absolutely important when you begin looking at the interpretation of all scripture. One of those pieces of the nature of God is that he is gracious. He's he's empowering. He is good. When we say that God is good, we we want you to to come away with this real uh, aha that there is no mixture in God. And good is good. Bad is bad. Now, it is amazing to me how many people in Christianity can take something that means good in everyday life, and then in religious lens, flip it because they can't figure out how to interpret any different. So they shift the definition of words and something that was evil or bad in everyday life now then is a good work of God. For instance, I've heard people say, well, you know, that little, that little baby that got cancer when she was two years old. Um, this is just a good work of God. God, you just have to trust in the goodness of God. You just have to trust that God knows what he's doing. And what they're defining is, is that God, because he didn't heal her, that in, she didn't experience a miracle. They prayed. They, pray, they got the prayer chains fired up because she didn't get healed that in fact it must then be that God is allowing her to have the cancer or that God stayed. He backed off and he is now then willing for this child to be sick, either willing in a proactive way or willing in an allow, quote unquote, allowance way. Well, why would we ever, ever take a two-year-old child that is stricken with sickness, disease, cancers, whatever it is, and then we would say that this is a good work of God. When in everyday life, we would never say that. We even send cards. We, we throw compassion to people. Now, isn't it interesting? Sometimes in our Christian uh, false religious lenses, we, we end up making humans even more noble than God. Like we're the ones that surround them with compassion, with graciousness, with kindness. We surround them with our heart and love. But in fact, God is the one that is striking people with sickness, pain, problems, and so on. Well, that's inconsistent. No, God is good. He is absolutely good all the time. So if you ever see scripture that seems that God is not good, what you have to do is default back to say, I'm going to put my emphasis on the goodness of God, but I'm going to explore this conflict text or even an experience that I have in modern real time, some experience that it seems like God might not be good. I'm going to go back and say, no, God is good. Now I'm going to use goodness to try to understand what's going on here. And I will not allow there to be a detraction. I will not uh, reduce the goodness of God while I'm exploring the, the solutions to these conflicts. This is so important, so important. God is always, always, always good. He is always love, love, love. He is always love. Now, again, as a parent, if I were to take my children and even put them in an environment where there was an epidemic, put them in an environment, if there was a laboratory that was filled with bacteria and disease and, uh, and some, you know, Ebola or other, you know, epidemic, and it's just, it's rich with this, this, you know, epidemic. And I were to bring my little children into that environment would, would I be in any kind of danger of, of indictment? Would I, would I in any way be in danger of being arrested? Would I in any way be uh, accused of child endangerment? In, in any way would I be? And the, question, the answer to that is absolutely would. Why is it that we act like God can in quote unquote, he's, he loves you, he, sweet little heart, he loves you and he just, he's doing some good work in you and, and he knows the only way he's going to get that good work in you is if, if he is, surrenders you to sickness, disease, pain, sorrow, grief, all that kind of stuff. Why is it that God can do that and he's not indicted and yet we would go to jail for it? as parents. 
Well, again, we have this radical inconsistency that a lot of, of Christians never stop to say, wait, 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 wait. If God is love, if God is love, Every time I see a manifestation of love, even throughout scripture, every time I see a manifestation of love or compassion or mercy, I always see deliverance. I always see freedom. I always see hope. I always see God intervening in grievous and suffering moments and bringing about an outcome of victory and being more than a conqueror and, and overcoming. And yet I don't see when God quote unquote moves with, he moved with mercy and he, all of them died of their sickness. You never see that. In fact, we typically call that, you know, in Old Testament terminology, and there's a lot of misunderstanding around this, but we usually call that the judgment of God. That when the people of God would get into uh, a, a huge, even national sickness, disease, pain, sorrow, oppression, we would always say, quote unquote, that's the judgment of God. Nobody would ever say, that is the mercy of God. That is, that's God loving on his people. Well, understand that when we talk about the love of God, we're talking about something that is constant in his nature, that God loves people. And his love means that he wants to do good. He's good. He's gracious. He's kind. He's merciful to his people. Now, again, that's all a reference to the nature or the character of God. But now I want to I wanna up the ante. I want to go a little bit further. And all this is going to matter in just a couple of minutes as we begin to ask questions around what about scriptures? What about this? And what about that? We're going we're gonna to take this understanding of the nature of God and then we're going to put it over some of these scenarios. So. Let's up the nature of God ante a little bit. Again, the word Jehovah, the word Jehovah in the Old Testament is a, is a word that means I am that I am or I am self-existent. God is non-contingent. He is not dependent on anybody or anything for him to exist or to be at peace and in joy and in freedom and in hope. Uh, all of his being is derived, uh, all of his contentment is derived from his own nature. He's self-existent. He's Jehovah. But God has revealed himself to us. And in his revelation to us, he said, my name is, and he would give himself a name, a name like Jehovah and then whatever the next part is. And it's what we call the redemptive names of God, redemptive, redemptive. Remember, we're in a course called Redemption, the redemptive names of God. This is God revealing himself in redemption of us. This is God saying, this is who I am. This isn't what I do. I'm not just trying to put on a mask, a front. I'm not putting on a personality for a moment. This is actually down to the core of my very essence. This is who I am. So as an example, in Exodus chapter 15 and in verse 26, God reveals himself to Israel. Now understand the Israelites had been in Egyptian slavery for 430 years. It was an intense and an oppressive uh, series of years and years and years, 430 years. That's, that's a lot. I mean, to think you went through something for 10 years is overwhelming, but generation after generation after generation, what that does to the neurobiology, what that does to uh, the self-esteem and the way people see uh, who they are, why they are, and so on. But they turn to God. They turn to God. They begin to pray. God raises up uh, a character by the name of Moses. Moses begins to be the mouthpiece of God. And there's a story in Exodus of God uh, delivering two million Jewish people from the Egyptian slavery and bondage. And they walk across the Red Sea, uh, big miracles happening, all of the Egyptian uh, overlords, all of these power brokers, they went back after this slave base, this, this employment uh, resource of Egypt, and they went after them to get them back and God delivered the Israelites. So they walk across the Red Sea on dry land, they get on the other side and they're moving on to this promised land that God told them about. 
Well, in the process of that, God talks to them about being their healer. There isn't one feeble person among them, two million people, not one baby with a sniffle, not, not one elderly person that is just feeble and, and, and lacking strength to make the journey of, you know, many, 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 many miles. And, and yet God comes and he says to them, I am Jehovah. And this is Exodus 15, 26. I am Jehovah. And this is what he said. This is the way it's translated. I am the Lord that heals you. I am the Lord that heals you. When you read that, and it, it feels like it's a promise. It feels like it's God saying, you know, if you ever have sickness or disease, you know what, I'm going to come and I'm going to be your healer. But that's actually not the way the original Hebrew writes it. The original Hebrew puts it in the redemptive nature of God. I am, I am Jehovah. I am Jehovah Rapha. Rapha is the Hebrew word for healer. I am Jehovah Rapha. God's saying, this is my nature. This is who I am. This isn't what I do. This isn't a mask I portray. This is fundamental to the very person of me. This is God. This is how I reveal myself to you. I am the Lord that heals you. Now, the reason that that's so important is because I want you to see healing is not, healing is not some uh, side issue, some ancillary promise that healing of our bodies is actually reflecting the very person of God in relationship with. This is who God says, when you talk to me, you're talking to a predisposed will, a sovereign will that is already determined, a predetermination that you are healed, that I will walk with you. I will be your God. And if I'm your God, the healer is your God. Do you understand the gravity of such things? We're not talking about the, the sterile, well, this could be something that God might do in a given situation if he is predisposed. This is God saying, you never have to ask the question if I'm your healer, if I'm predisposed, if it's my will. I, in my very nature, am your healer. Well, in the same way that he gives us these ideas around him being our healer, we see that his name is Jehovah Rohi. Rohi, that means the Lord my shepherd. Psalm 23 is a famous scripture uh, where he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, God is in his very nature, his redemptive names. He is our shepherd. We also know he's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, Jireh, provider. I am that I am. My very existence, non-contingent. Now watch, watch this, watch this. If God is our provider and it's non-contingent, that means God doesn't have to wait for the circumstances to line up or for this you know, universe or for sickness, disease to cooperate that actually because it's a part of the very nature of God, God will always transcend any opposition to be your provider. He is already your provider. He's predisposed to be your provider. God is never able to contradict himself as your provider. God always provides. He always has created the opportunity for your need to be met in your business, in your home, in your family, whatever the provision is. And the provision in scripture was always a reference to some material thing, some material thing. It began with a ram that was provided in a sacrifice moment that God provided. And see, so he says, I am the Lord Jehovah. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am the Lord who provides. That's who I am. So again, what I'm trying to do is show you that this is a part of the very redemptive nature of God. There are other words like uh, the Lord, my righteousness, that's the nature of God, that he would be our righteousness, he would be our justice, that he would be the rightness, the rightness. He would allow us to come before him in legality, that we could be legally pure before him because this is in his nature. It is what he desires. He desires that we legally have full, unadulterated and uncompromised access to him. Now, again, there are multiple uh, redemptive names. What I'm trying to do is, again, pick up from last session where we were talking about where there is sin, open sin, unatoned sin. There is always 
sickness, disease, poverty, lack, need. There is uh, depression, oppression. There are a lack of wisdom and inability to make uh, appropriate decisions, faulty thought processes. There is the overwhelming sense of anxiety. Uh, I mean, you just go right down you know, the, the continuum of all the negatives that would be uh, a part of death. All of that is because of sin, open sin, unatoned or unredeemed sin. Whenever you see sin that's redeemed, when you see sin taken care of, you always see God intervening and bringing this uh, blessing, this favor, uh, healing for the body, prosperity, God divinely empowering people to generate material blessing in life. We're looking at wisdom, insight, understanding, clarity. Understanding is nothing more than clarity of thought processes. And God is infusing that into the people that he is walking with and has forgiven of, of their sin. So what I'm doing again is I'm just building this case that the will of God is not something that is, uh, you know, we just never know. You just, you know, man, if I could just know the will of God. Well, understand that the redemptive side of God's will, that was established in Christ. That when Jesus went to Calvary's cross and he he redeemed us even for the forgiveness of our sin that all of these curses, all of these penalties, all of these things were done away with and now we get to experience the full measure of the nature of God to us in his goodness, in his mercy as a God who loves us with all that he is. Shift gears just for a second and now then let's cycle back to Jesus. If you ever want to know what the express will of God is, look at Jesus. So a couple of questions. When you look at Jesus, is there ever an occasion where Jesus says to somebody who's struggling in their physical bodies with sickness, disease, pain, so on, is there ever a moment Jesus says to any, anybody, anybody ever, where he says to him, it is the Father's will that you stay sick? Is there ever an occasion when Jesus ever said that? And again, if you were to take modern day Christian thought, modern day Christian preaching, modern day Christian paradigms, you would believe that Jesus would somewhere around 50% or more that Jesus would have said to the crowds, the masses that came to him to be healed. He, Jesus would have said somewhere around 50%. He would have said to him, no, I'm sorry for you. It is God's will that you retain it. There's a lesson God's trying to get into you. There's some things you're not going to learn unless you go through a ton of suffering and pain physically. And so you, this is your lot. This is the will of God to you. Again, if it's modern day, that's the way Jesus would have executed. And yet we don't see one example, not one example of that. Does that should that matter? To me, I think it is huge in the level of how much it should matter. Sometimes people talk about, uh, you know, that God wants some to be poor and some to be rich. And, you know, God has his unique calling and assignments to people. And so there's, there's this thing where God might want to meet a need, not meet a need. Or you hear this, well, God meets needs, but not desires. Which incidentally, that is contrary to what Jesus taught. Jesus said, what things ever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. Snap. Jesus said, whatever you desire, you desire. And it's interesting because both need and desire, where one ends and the other begins, those are extremely subjective. You know, in our Western world, when we talk about needs, we talk about needs in, in our American society. Uh, we, you know, we think we need to uh, have, you know, at least a, a medium income. You know, we, we need to uh, not be, you know, lower income. Lower income would be people that are struggling, at least medium income. But you understand that around the world, lower income in the United States would be tantamount to extreme wealth, extreme wealth in other parts of the world. People who don't have shoes, people who don't have water wells in their little community, people who have, you know, any kind of plumbing or running water or, you know, any, any, uh, they are so uh, uh, archaic in the way their communities function. We would be extremely wealthy. So an American would say, well, I'm not going to desire some extravagant. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to believe God uh, to meet my need, a need. I need my, 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 me and my children, my children. We just need, we need a pair of jeans. 
And so, you know, I'm, I'm praying. I'm praying for a pair of jeans. And, uh, you know, I'm not asking anything extravagant. Just, you know, if we could just, if we got a new pair of jeans at Old Navy, Old Navy, some of the lesser expensive jeans on the world's market today, if I could just get me some Old Navy jeans. Whew, I'm not asking for anything extravagant. Says who? Says who that that's not extravagant? It may not be extravagant and you're in Hollywood or Leewood or some other wood. It may not be extravagant there, but it is extravagant on the world's playing field. It's extravagant where many of the population, most of the population of the world is. Well, you know, I'm just going to go down to one of these, you know, places where they have trade-in clothes. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to Goodwill and get me some jeans there. Well, even there, jeans there, secondhand jeans there. That is extreme wealth for other parts of the world. So this whole idea, God meets needs but not desires, is a bunch of religious hogwash. It's just a bunch of mental work around things that uh, people have no revelation of from the word. When I look at Jesus, I never see Jesus ever promoting poverty. I never see him coming into an environment and saying, you know what, you've got too much. You've got too much. You know, when he had the little boy who brought him fishes and loaves and then Jesus multiplies fishes and loaves. This is a great story in the Bible. Jesus saw this multitude. They're getting weary. It's somewhere, you know, five to 15,000 people, uh, probably with wives and children that were accounted for. And a huge crowd. And they're on a hillside. There's no McDonald's. There's no buffets. They got nothing close by. They didn't have 7-Eleven. Nothing. Can't get a candy bar, cheese crackers. Nothing. And Jesus sees that they're weary, and he says to the disciples, go find some food here, just among us. Has anybody got any food? And there's a little boy that had some fish and loaves, just a basket, and that's it. And Jesus takes it and multiplies it. He blesses it, and the fish and loaves end up feeding all five to 15,000 people. Well, the little boy who had given that, Jesus didn't say, well, you've got too much. You've got too much. What Jesus did is he sent that boy home with 12 basketfuls. That's not what the little boy came with. He came with one. He goes home with 12 basketfuls. I never see Jesus ever go into an environment and detract materially from the environment. I see Jesus constantly multiplying. I see Jesus seeing the pain of people's lack, the pain of people's hunger, the pain of people's sorrow. I mean, let's, let's get real. Was there anybody on that mountainside that maybe could have made it for another five hours and gotten home? And they would have recovered. They would have recovered from the, the hunger pains in them. But see, Jesus, he is the express image of God the Father. And Jesus is good. And because he's good, he says, no, 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 no. Yeah, they could make it and they could recover. Probably there wouldn't be anybody that would be long-term hurt for not eating today. I mean, all of us probably even back then could go a meal without suffering, you know, extensively. But Jesus, he's like, no, these are, I love people. This is my nature. This is the nature of the Father. And I'm going to bless. I'm going to multiply. I'm going to take care of. Now, again, if you take this story, you put it on modern day theology and modern day Christian, you know, interpretation of things, you would have to believe that Jesus would have peeled out various percentages of, of that group of the five to 15,000 said, you know, you, you know, there's about a thousand of you. You, you know, you get nothing, no soup for you. You get nothing. You get nothing. Um, and then there should be, you know, maybe another thousand that's like, okay, you get, you get to eat just a little bit and then another, you get more and then another, because the will of God is different for everybody. But see, the will of God, this is so powerful. Get this. The will of God that Jesus shows us is not about individual situations. It is about God's very nature. And because God is more than enough. In fact, one of his names is El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough. Because God's more than enough, you get into contact with God. You start walking with God and you walk with his nature. This is how God reveals himself to us. This is who he is. So, you know, when people start talking about 
how God's will is this, you know, real time, you got to kind of figure it out. And your experience is the authoritative lens that you interpret the will of God. So if I pray and nothing happens, it must not have been will, the will of God for me. All of that is so stinking bogus. It's just bogus. It, it elevates human experience to the level of the divine word of God and the divine play of God's redemption. That redemption should be the greatest authority of our lives revealed through scripture. And if you want to know the will of God, look at redemption. Don't look at your experience. Your experience can change, but redemption can. Now, let's switch gears. If all of this is true that I've been talking about, then what do you do with certain texts? Like, you know, in the Old Testament, don't you have stories like the, the book of Job? Or some people see J-O-B, that's how you spell it. It's look like the job, you know, the employment book, the book of job. No, it's, it's pronounced by most people as Job, Job. And Job is a dude, man. Job is a God lover. So Job had a very difficult nine to 12 months of his life. Uh, the entire book of Job is uh, somewhere between nine and 12 months. 42 chapters that span only 9 to 12 months of his life. Well, if you know something about the first chapter of Job, it tells us that God came, uh, Satan came before God, and God says to Satan, God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, the only reason Job is serving you is because uh, you have blessed him, you have protected him, you've taken care. But if, if you would curse him, if you would just turn your back on him, God, Job would turn his back on you in a heartbeat. If any evil, any suffering hits him, he'll turn on you in a heartbeat. And, uh, and God says, well, you can't kill him. You can't kill him. So this is all King James or most translations, how the story plays out. The next thing you know, Job gets these boils, he gets sick, his kids get uh, into uh, enormous natural disaster moments. They die or war comes and they die. It's just some big, crazy stuff. And Job is in intense grieving. And then Job makes this statement, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Many people have taken this one chapter and they have used it to define God, his nature, his personality. They have taken it to understand the will of God for every situation of their life. Every verse that ever says anything good about God, they take this, this one chapter, and then they put it over the goodness of God and say, no, nope, no, nope, God can't be that good. There's always nuances. There's always small print in the contract. God can't be exclusively good because of this one chapter. In other words, they take the chapter as being the ultimate revelation of God's will, and everything that comes after that is only either equal or less than this one chapter. Well, again, as we have talked about progressive revelation, what we're supposed to do is take our greatest revelation, which is redemption, and then put that shining light on top of Old Testament conflicts. So let's look at the book of Job just quickly. I'll give you a quick, quick overview, very quick overview. When uh, God uh, tells us about this book of Job, uh, this, this person, this character, we first need to understand that the book of Job, listen, the book of Job is the first book of the Bible, Old Testament and New, the first book of the Bible that was ever written. Now, chronologically, in understanding of all of creation, the book of Genesis is the beginning of our Bible that tells us how God made the heavens and the earth, and then we move forward, finally getting into the story of Job. But the first book that was written was the book of Job. It was written before the book of Genesis. So this Job guy, he didn't have the privilege of a Bible. He had a very shallow, limited revelation of God. We know in the first chapter he is sacrificing animals and he kept fearing that his children had sinned and that they would turn on God. So the fact that he is actually giving sacrifices shows that he had a covenant with God and it appears to be a very simplistic covenant. But here's something that I want you to take away. Job, Job had no Bible. He had an extreme limited revelation of God. Job could not even read the first chapter of Job. 
You get to read the first chapter of Job, which automatically out of the gate gives you more revelation about God than Job had. In the first chapter of Job, it says that Satan was the one who came and created the havoc in Job's life, not God. Job didn't know that. So Job surmises that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He thought God did it because he had a limited revelation of God. You and I read the book of Job and we know that Satan did it. So it wasn't God who gave and took away, even though this is going to mess up many, many pastors' funeral messages because this is a common verse in funeral messages. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Time, time out. That is because Job... Even though he stated that, even though it's recorded what he stated, what he stated is not accurate. Read chapter 1, Satan came and he did what Jesus said. He came to steal, kill, and to destroy. Now then, one of the questions that people will bring up about Job is, well, didn't God, the Father, didn't God give Job over to Satan? Because God says to Satan, Satan comes before the presence of God and God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Job? So if you were to read it in the just direct line upon line phraseology of that first chapter, you would have a broken angle, a broken understanding as to what took place. Isn't it interesting? Let's push pause here. Let's just talk about the way we interpret everything. Sometimes you have uh, situations where somebody walks into a room and they begin to talk to you and you are thinking, man, you're emotionally unengaged to me. You don't seem to make eye contact. You are down. Uh, It appears that you're distracted a bit and our brains make up a story in that moment and what our brains begin to do is is assess, uh, do you like me? Do you love me? Are you for me? Are you on my team? Did I hurt you? Have I offended you? Is there something personal to me that I need to uh, begin to assess? And our brains get so hyped up in that mode that we start thinking, well, it might have been this that I said, or it might have been this that I did. We begin to uh, assume the worse, and yet a little bit later we find out that there was some kind of suffering, grief, tragedy that happened in this person's life prior to them coming into our presence, and their distraction was completely unrelated to us. That didn't change, though, the fact that we went into this whole interpretation mode. Whenever you're reading biblical text, biblical text that has conflict in it, if all you have access to is what you have in that moment, your brain will often make up stories that are built in assumption. You'll begin to say, well, it could be this and it could be that and it could be this. And general Christian theology has taken the easy road and just said, well, it just, this is just the will of God. This is the way, but the problem is, is if God is offering up Job, if God is taking Satan and saying, here, I want to give uh, my child into your hands, that is an act of non-goodness. And now then we have the very nature of God in conflict. And if God is not absolute, everything about God is now at a loss. Because God cannot be a mixture of any one thing without becoming a mixture of everything. And then he becomes nothing. So when God uh, says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? We have to take the New Testament a revelation of redemption that is ultimately expressed in Christ, in Jesus, who he is. We begin to look at the nature of God, who God in his nature is, how he interacts with humanity, who is God, who is man in redemption, and what is the nature play of God towards man so that we could be restored to him. When we look at all of that, here's one of the things we know. God is always good. God is always good. We also know that God in his love will always bring mercy to protect. God never shows mercy. God never shows love to put people into vulnerabilities and risk. We don't ever see examples of that. Now, people have said, well, because God's love and we have interpreted that God gave Job over to Satan, that love must have done it. Well, that's, that's, that's ridiculous uh, jumping. That is uh, awkward. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of jagged. It's uh, inconsistent. And so uh, what my encouragement is, is it, can you find one example in the Bible where it explicitly says the mercy of God kills, steals, and destroys for people? You won't find it. 
So God is good and God is love. Now here's another component as we look at the greater light of the New Testament and shine it on the old. Jesus is considered our intercessor. Jesus is our intercessor. This is a part of redemption. If Jesus is our intercessor, then what we know is that God the Father has things that he wants to do in humans' lives. He wants to do in humans' lives that are good and healthy and strong. But for some reason, in human choices and in a fallen world, in the legalities of uh, the justice of God, that there are things that uh, require Jesus to come in and to be an advocate, to be an intercessor, to stand in between. You see, if everything happened just the way God wanted, because God wanted, there would be no need for Jesus to be an intercessor. It'd just be the sovereign will of God that's dominant, and bam, it happens. But because Jesus is an intercessor, we know that not all of the will of God is being executed the way that God wants, and so he brings Jesus in to be an intercessor. So if Jesus is an intercessor, then that means that God in his omniscience. So now we have another component of God's nature. All this is going to come back to Job. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows tomorrow before tomorrow happens. And he understands motives of heart before any human even knows their own motives. Or in this case, I'm going to suggest that Satan had motives. So let's go back to the book of Job. Satan comes before the presence of God, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? What if, what if when God says, have you considered my servant Job, it was an act of redemptive intercession? What if God in his divine knowledge, in his omniscience, what if he knew that Satan was getting ready to kill, steal, and destroy from Job. God knew that for some reason there is a legality. There is something of spiritual law that Job, that Job has opened himself to. Maybe God knew that there was some level of vulnerability in Job. And, you know, he is, he's opened his hedge is the scripture says in chapter one that the hedge, Satan said the hedge is down. If the hedge is down and the hedge was down for uh, Satan to go in and to, to hurt Job, to hurt his family. What if God knew all of that in advance? And God is actually saying to Satan, Satan, I know you're going to come kill, steal, and destroy. And I know that there are some legal reasons and rights that you have that you could do some things here. But I'm going to confront you as an intercessor and say, you cannot kill him. What if God proactively had this conversation as an act of protecting Job, not as an act of offering Job up? Well, again, if you take the New Testament light of who God is, all of this begins to get clearer and clearer. Now, here's what's true about the book of Job. We don't have anything in the book of Job that tells us why the tragedy happened. And so to squeeze it down and to come up with an exact reason is actually irresponsible. It's not there. It's nowhere in the 42 chapters. When you go to the New Testament, which again is the greater revelation, we have an example of Job. Job is mentioned in the book of James chapter 5. And when Job is mentioned, it says to consider the patience or the constancy, the consistency of Job. Consider the constancy of Job. So the entire book of Job is put into our Bible for this reason, according to what James said. So what we're doing is we're taking what James, the greater revelation that is now then washed through redemption, and we're looking back at Job. The book of Job is not to tell us of the nature and character of God that God is sometimes offering up to us to Satan. But in fact, the book of Job is for this reason. When all hell is breaking loose in your life, when you get boils on your skin, your kids die in accidents, you have any kind of uh, unresolved answers, unresolved issues. You don't know how to interpret. Anytime you have all of, the, all of this satanic attack in your life, all this stuff is melting down. Anytime you have that, the book of Job is to encourage you to stay faithful. When you don't know the answers to questions, you don't know why's, and you can't answer all of these shadows of doubt. You don't know what's happening. That You just stay faithful. You stay constant. You don't curse God. You don't turn your back on God. You keep moving forward. Now, as Job did that, in 9 to 12 months of his life, so the whole 42-chapter book is only 9 to 12 
uh, years of his life, in those nine to, uh, I'm sorry, nine to 12 months of his life, in those nine to 12 months, at the end, Job repents. Job repents. So there's some things that he takes ownership of. He repents. He puts his hand on his mouth. All the negative things he said, all the things that he misunderstood, he takes those back. He repents from them. And then the Bible says that God restored to him double what he had before. Double what he had before. So in the book of Job, what we have is when you stay faithful, when you keep your heart humble, when you don't understand things, you don't blame God, you don't accuse God, you don't tell God that he uh, mismanaged you, you don't blame God for all the things that happened in your life, but you stay faithful to what you know in the light of truth, the light of redemption. You stay faithful. And when you stay faithful in the goodness of God, ultimately, even when you don't have answers to all of your pain, ultimately what's going to happen is, is you're going to see the hand of your redemptive God, the God who's Jehovah Jireh, the God who's Jehovah Rapha, the God who's El Shaddai, Jehovah, the self-existent God, pouring himself out on you. And even in a season of pain that you don't know why it happened, that in fact you say God is good and he's for me and God did not commission it, God did not allow it. I don't understand it, but I don't have to fill in those gaps. I'm staying faithful to what I know. That when you do that, that it, the nature of God pours out goodness in your life to such a degree that you have double what you had before. So the book of Job is not, well, what about? Well, again, take the light of redemption and shine it on it. Well, that brings us to another what about. What about Paul's thorn? Didn't Paul pray three times for God to, to, to heal him or deliver him and, uh, and, and God didn't? Well, let's talk about that for a second. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, we have a story where the Apostle Paul said that there was a thorn in the flesh. I, I had this thorn in the flesh. It was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. So first of all, I want you to notice that the thorn in the flesh, whatever this quote unquote thorn in the flesh that he had, he said it was a messenger of Satan. So it wasn't a gift of God. It was a messenger of Satan. And the word buffet is the idea of constant beatings, just like waves of an ocean beating against the bow of a boat. It is the buffeting. that There was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, Paul says. Well, let's put context to this whole story. Right after he says this messenger of Satan was sent to buffet me, he says, I prayed three times and uh, asked the Lord, to relieve me of this. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. This is Jesus speaking to him. My grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul goes on to say, I would rather glory in my weaknesses because when I am weak, then am I strong. So many people take this chapter uh, and they begin to surmise that Paul was sick, that he was sick. And the sickness he had was something that God wanted him to have. And when he asked God to heal him, because in their context, now think about this, in a religious context, uh, theology would say that healing is an ancillary side issue in the mind of God that God might be predisposed to do or might not. It is not in their mind central to redemption. So, in this story, they read it and they say, well, Paul must have been sick and his sickness must have uh, caused him uh, to pray. And he prays three times and God says back to him, Jesus says back to him, no, you can't be healed. I'm going to give you grace to carry your sickness through your life and this will be a part of my plan for you. And so many people today will say, well, see, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And if God didn't want him to be healed, then it can't be in redemption. And therefore, it can't be God's will for everybody. Okay. Okay. Let's back this train up and let's look at this for a second. If you take a few verses back, Paul says this. He says, I knew a man, he's talking most people on either side of interpretation of, of healing and miracles. Most people would say that Paul was talking about himself. He says, I was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. I don't have words to articulate what has happened. And he says that there was, lest I would be, this is Paul's words, lest I would be exalted above measure, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. So let's just stop there. When Paul says that lest I be exalted, many people, in, again, in traditional theology would say 
that God didn't want Paul to be proud. And so God didn't want him to be exalted. Time out, time out, time out. How about let's just go ahead and interpret scripture with scripture and quit just, you know, letting all these ancillary ideas and extremely weak connections uh, come together. For instance, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5, Paul is, or Peter is talking to uh, a group of pastors. And he says to the younger pastors, if you'll humble yourself into the mighty hand of God, God will exalt you, exalt you in due time. I want you to notice it is God's desire to exalt you. God's wanting you to be exalted. So when it says, Paul's saying that lest I be exalted above measure, that wasn't God trying to keep him from being exalted. God wanted to exalt him because the exaltation is the influence of Paul. And the influence of Paul is that Paul had what's called the Pauline revelation. And the Pauline revelation was redemption. Are you kidding me? The Pauline revelation was redemption like I'm teaching you right now. The Pauline revelation is who you are in Christ of what Christ did for you. And because that he uh, had this divine revelation and, and he would pray to all, he would ask all the churches, pray for me that when I opened my mouth to preach this stuff, that I would have a door of utterance and I could speak it boldly. So what the enemy was trying to do was to stop him from being able to teach and preach on the revelation of who you are in Christ, the revelation of redemption, the revelation of grace through Christ, that you could be saved by grace and through faith. That is the revelation of Paul. All that I'm talking about in redemption, this entire workshop, that's what Paul was preaching and that is what Satan hated. So this messenger of Satan was sent to him to buffet him. Well, this word buffet in the messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him. Well, what could possibly be the buffeting? What could possibly be the buffeting? Well, I think it's important to ask the question, is there any other time, any other time in the Bible that there is a reference to thorns, thorns, because again, it's called metaphorically the thorn in the flesh. Paul names it that. If it's a thorn in the flesh, is there any other, any other opportunities throughout Scripture where the word thorn or thorn in the flesh is used? Because that would be a key. That would be a code to be able to crack the interpretation of this thorn in the flesh of Paul. Now, before I show you what the Scripture says about thorns, I think it's important for you to understand traditional theology and most Christians, they will extrapolate that Paul's thorn in the flesh was an eye disease an eye disease called ophthalmia. There is nowhere in the text that it says that. Nowhere. What they do is they take a reference in the book of Galatians where Paul says, you saw how big a letter I wrote you, a big letter I wrote you. And what they do is they begin to interpret, well, that means that Paul was straining at reading. And because he was straining at reading, maybe he had this bloody flux, this eye disease. Not just for a second, think about this, that even in the book of Acts, there's a time he's preaching and he was probably preaching redemption because that's what he preached. And there was a man who was sick, and the Bible says that Paul, perceiving the man, had faith to be healed. For this guy, he's getting aroused in faith, man. He's ready to believe for his miracle. And Paul ends up saying, get up. And the man gets up, and he walks and shouts and dances, had this enormous miracle. Now, if Paul was standing there with an eye disease, an eye disease, and it's got this blood, this flux, this pus just flowing down his eyes, just gross as all get up. If Paul was standing there with that, and it was, it's never definitive as to whether it's the will of God or not. You just have to live by a prompting in a moment, some mood experienced in this situation. Is there any way this dude's going to be inspired and roused to faith and say, whoo, Paul wouldn't have looked at him and said, you have faith to be healed. That man wouldn't have had an ounce of faith. Now, there is nowhere in the scripture that Paul had an eye disease. Even that idea, how big a letter, that is so, it's so, it's, I don't, it's like, do we even have to respond to such things? Come on, bring something a little more, not a little more, bring something substantial, period. Not just these little ideas. So it wasn't an eye disease, I promise you. So is there anywhere in the Bible that it says a thorn? A thorn was used throughout scripture to share with us what is uh, possibly Paul's thorn in the flesh. Well, there are, there are some examples. For instance, in Numbers, Numbers chapter 33, it says in verse 55, if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, when it shall be that those whom let you, uh, you let remain 
will be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. So this is an Old Testament verse, and here thorns in your sides is a metaphor of harassing people, people harassing you, people harassing you. I want you to get that. These are the enemies of God in the Old Testament that came to harass the Israelites. And God said, if you don't run them out of the land, they will be an irritant to you. They will harass you and they will be thorns in your eyes. In Joshua 23, 13, notice this. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. So here we have again the enemies of God, nations of people that would be thorns in your eyes, thorns in your eyes. So in the ex examples we have in scripture of thorns, here we have two examples. They both are references to harassing nations, harassing peoples that would be irritants to you. So let's go back to Paul's thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go back one chapter, chapter 11, before the thorn in the flesh is talked about. Chapter 11, Paul talks about all the persecutions, all the pain, all the struggle, all the sorrow that he is enduring to obey God. And, you know, there were times Paul would even be stoned and left for dead, and then he would rise up from the dead. People who were professional stoners, they know when somebody's dead, and they thought he was dead, but the power of God came on him and he got raised up. Paul was constantly in physical persecution. He's constantly battling through all these, these oppositions and irritants. He'd go into a town to preach, and the, the community, the religious people of the day, they would rise up and they would fight against him. And again, there was verbal persecution, there was physical persecution, there was any number of irritating responses. Now, if you take that and then fast forward it and put it into uh, chapter 12, and he says, lest I be exalted above measure, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. This messenger of Satan sent to buffet me just in the context of Scripture and then taking these metaphors of thorns in the Old Testament, it seems much more plausible. In fact, it's the only substantial interpretation that Paul would go into these cities and this messenger of Satan, this angel, demonic angel, would go in and stir up influencing the religious leaders. It was supernatural causes and the religious leaders would get aroused and then they would come to beat on, to buffet the apostle Paul. So when he says, I prayed and asked the Lord to take it away, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. Let's talk about that for a second. When in the Bible do you ever see grace limited to just giving you the power to endure pain? Now, I'm not saying that there can't be grace that helps you endure pain, but when do you see it limited to that? For instance, for by grace are you saved through faith. So we know that we get to experience salvation. We miss hell and go to heaven because of the grace of God, the grace well, if the grace of God is something that's an empowerment, it is a divine ability, it's the power of God revealed in our human weakness, if God's power is such, then wouldn't grace, get this, you got to get this, wouldn't grace in this context give you the ability to go to hell but endure the pain of hell throughout all eternity if that's what grace does? You parallel that to Paul when, they, when people say, well, God gave Paul grace to endure this messenger of Satan. No, no, no. What God is saying is, is that when you receive my grace, you receive spiritual authority. Don't be asking me to get rid of this messenger of Satan. You take dominion over that messenger of Satan. You take dominion over that which the enemy came to do. Do you ever notice in James 4 it says, submit yourself to God. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. In uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, this is Paul, so he knows this. He knows, he wrote this, so he knows this. That they who receive, which is an active verb, they who receive the abundance of grace, grace, and of the gift of righteousness will reign, R-E-I-G-N, will reign 
And one translation says, reign as kings in life by one Jesus Christ. When Jesus says to him, my grace is sufficient, sufficient grace is the grace of God that empowers you to take dominion over Satan and all of his activities. This isn't God saying that I'm, I'm now then going to just give you up to the enemy. I'm not just, I'm not just saying this is your, you know, cross the bear, quote unquote. He's saying, listen, I've given you spiritual authority and redemption. I, I caught you up so that you would get this revelation. I got you up into the third heaven so that you would walk in the redemption I've given you. Now take that grace and walk in it. And so Paul says, whoo, anytime I find myself in weakness, anytime I find myself in not enough, I step into that grace, that empowerment of God. And then when I am weak, I become strong. When I don't have, I begin to have. He begins to talk about this in terms of the spiritual authority delivered him. And later he even says that there have been many Many troubles, many tribulations, but the Lord has delivered us from them all. So again, I just want you to see Paul's thorn is not a shadow of doubt around redemption. It's actually just the opposite. We have other examples of whatabouts that often come up. People ask questions about People ask questions about John chapter 9 and verse 1. There was a man who was born blind and people brought this man who was born blind to Jesus and said, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because in that day, those folks were interpreting that if somebody was born blind, that it was because of sin. Somebody individually, the individual sin. So did this boy in the womb, in the womb, now that he's a man, but in the womb, did he sin or was it his mom and dad who sinned that he was born blind? Jesus said this. Now listen. Jesus said, neither, neither. So he answers that question, done. Don't even need to ask who sinned, neither. Then he says this, but that the works of God might be manifest, that the works of God be, might be manifest, I must work the works of him who sent me. And then Jesus heals him. Some people, and again, I got, I got to be completely transparent. This is just mind boggling to me that you could take that statement and then somehow think that uh, it's Jesus saying that the blindness is a work of God. That the blindness is a work of God. What Jesus said is that the works of God might be manifest. The works of God might be manifest. I'm going to have to heal him. The work of God was the healing. The work of God was not the blindness. Again, why, why is it that people jump to these massive conclusions that are heavy issues of doctrine when they have such shallow reasoning behind it. The reason I'm being so passionate around this is when you understand redemption, you will never again abdicate even a shadow, even a thought. You'll never abdicate any part of your being to a question of what God's will is. That God in His nature, He's passionate towards our forgiveness of sin, the healing of our body, and the prosperity of our lives. And that is not because healing and prosperity is some higher order issue. It's just the systems that show us how to live in joy, how to live in... There's never a day God wants you to be oppressed. Never a day God wants you depressed. Never a situation God wants you to walk into without having favor in your life. There's never a situation that you walk into that God doesn't want you to have wisdom. All of that now then has been made a part of the new covenant born again experience. We have all of that in divine graces on the inside of us. So again, rather than moving around with all these kind of ancillary weak thoughts, let's stay true to redemption. What happened in redemption and then interpret everything else through the lens of that redemption. That's going to keep us tight and safe. Sometimes people will take scriptures in the Bible of experiences like Timothy. Uh, there's an occasion in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23 where Paul tells Timothy, so Paul is his spiritual father and Paul's an apostle and he understands redemption. And Paul, who's an apostle, understanding redemption, says to Timothy, Timothy's somewhere in his late teens to early 20s and he's a, a young understudy, a spiritual son and he is a Christian leader. But Paul tells him in verse 23, 1 Timothy 5, he says to him, don't drink any more wa uh, water don't drink any more water, but drink a little wine for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities. So some people are like, well, see, if it was God's will to heal everybody, Paul would have just healed him and that would be it. Do you realize how weak that argument is? 
I mean, you do realize that there are people who struggle with sin, but that never brings up the question as to whether it's God's will to forgive sin. Never. There's people who struggle to receive forgiveness of sin. Even though God's forgiven them, they're living in condemnation and guilt and shame. Why don't we ever question that and say, well, if it is really God's will to forgive everybody, nobody should ever deal with shame. Listen, we're living in a fallen world. Satan came to steal, kill, and to destroy. This fallen world's filled with entropy. So often, even if you understand redemption, like what I'm teaching you and preaching to you, even in this very moment, this past week, I had a head cold come. A head cold came into my, my own body, my own, my own life. And I was sleeping a whole lot and resting, drinking a lot of water and even taking med medicines. Well, if it's God's will and it's in redemption, then why did you have a head cold? Because I live in a fallen world and I only have the light I have on how to appropriate it. And I'm walking in new light. We're going to talk a lot more about how to reconcile those two issues of what Jesus did in redemption and what your experience is. We're going to talk a lot more about that in the coming sessions. But for now, this isn't an issue of your experience. Timothy's experience has no bearing on redemption. Do you understand? Timothy's experience has no bearing on redemption. So Timothy was struggling with something and Paul tells him don't drink water, which we understand that in the day the water was contaminated and it's possible that every time Timothy would drink water it would cause him stomach issues because of the contaminants in the water like much of the world today. So what Paul tells him is, look dude, just quit drinking the water. Quit drinking the water. Yes, it says in the Great Commission, it says in Mark 16, you'll drink any deadly thing and it won't harm you. I get that. Paul's, I get that. I get it. Paul, and I believe Paul would be thinking the same thing. I get that. But listen, dude, you, you keep having these struggles in your stomach. Drink some wine. Wine was a natural, normal beverage of the day. And wine would now then prevent the uh, bacteria that would get in the water from getting in his system and causing the stomach and infirmity issues. So, but the, the real issue for me around Timothy's stomach is, is why are we even talking about it? So what? So what Timothy had infirmities? That doesn't change redemption. And so what if you have infirmity? So what if you declared the word? So what if you took spiritual authority and your circumstances didn't change? That doesn't change redemption. All it means is that you and I are in a real-time progress of walking out our faith. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're in a journey with Jesus. Thankfully, what stabilizes that journey is what we absolutely know in redemption. I want to encourage you with that. I want to encourage you, don't look at scriptures and just simply say, because I read Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2. I read Epaphroditus. He was sick nigh unto death. And God, it says God had mercy on him, by the way. He had mercy. What, what happened when mercy came? Well, he died. No, that's not what happened. He had mercy on him and he ended up being healed. The reason he was sick is because he wore himself out working in his, in his kingdom church, in his local church. So again, what I'm trying to do is elevate the idea that redemption is the central part of what Jesus did for us. Everything else that we have questions on, we want to shove through this portal of redemption and say, how are we going to process it in the revelation of redemption? When you understand redemption, it begins to interpret or help you understand and give you insights. If you know the nature of God, if you know that He's good, He's merciful, He's omniscient, He's omnipotent, you know, he's sovereign, you know, all these things in the context for which we've talked about it, all of a sudden you can put that lens of redemption over any conflict of scripture and then any conflict that's in your life, anything that's fallen apart, anything that's failed you and you don't blame God anymore. You don't say, God, where were you? What you say is, God, I don't know everything, but I know something. And what I know is going to be enough for me to live out a great purpose and plan and to change the world. And God, I'm going to walk in greater light tomorrow than I had today. I'm going to live in greater appropriate, uh, I'm going to appropriate greater miracles tomorrow than I had today. And Lord, together, we're going to experience amazing things. Well, guys, this is workshop number five. I'm excited for where God's taken us. Stay tuned. Can't wait for session six. I believe it's all going to change your life. God bless you.